Okay, I believe we are recording, so we are going to get started. Thank you so much for joining us today for our session, Franchising as a Career, an Investment, or Both. And give me one second. Sometimes I, my slides were advancing perfectly before we started. There we go. Okay, so a little bit about myself. My name is Sarah Wasco. Uh, I own FranNet of Dallas-Fort Worth in Oklahoma. Um, I'll share a little bit more about FranNet and what we do here in just a minute. Uh, I have eight years experience in the franchise industry. So I joined FranNet back in 2012. Uh, four years, I was able and honored to serve on our advisory committee. And so that was a liaison between our headquarters and the franchisees. So I was able to uh, be involved in a lot of the decisions to help our franchise grow. So we are a franchise ourselves. I have over 16 years uh, in sales and consulting with small business owners. Ten and a half of those years I spent with AT&T. So I had the corporate environment. I left back in 1998, so a long time ago. Uh, Ten years was about all I could do, though, with that. And my youngest child was born, and so it was time for me to step back. I was fortunate enough to be able to be a stay-at-home mom for a while. And then I actually worked for a startup. So I have been uh, able to experience both the corporate environment and the small business environment from lots of different perspectives, which is kind of what attracted me to franchising. So I'm a franchisee with two brands. As I mentioned, Friend that is a franchise. And then my husband and I also own a gym franchise and have four locations here in Dallas, Fort Worth. And I have lived in this Metroplex since 1987. I actually live in Grapevine now, but we lived in Keller for about 30 years, raised our kids there. Um, and then moved to Grapevine a couple of years ago. And I share that because I've kind of focused my business on the Fort Worth Tarrant County side of the Metroplex. And I'm happy to introduce you today to my colleague, Roxanne Rapsky, who has been with FranNet uh, since 2013, but started her own franchise consulting business prior to that. So she has been with FranNet quite some time, um, started the franchise consulting industry after being involved in the mortgage banking industry for 20 years. Um, she too is a franchisee and she just recently relocated. And so she is going to be working with clients on the Dallas side of the Metroplex, living on that side of the Metroplex. And we all know that it's a big market. And um, so it makes sense for her to serve clients on that side of the, the Metroplex. So today, we really, and I'm going to try my hardest to keep this to an hour. Um, sometimes I get talking and excited, um, but we will we'll do our best to cover all these topics in a 60-minute period. I know you guys are taking time out of your day, but we're going to talk about why on earth somebody would want to go into business. What are some of the options for getting into business? Clearly, franchising is one, and there's pros and cons to, to the different methods of going into business. What are some of the risks and rewards of business ownership? What are some of the myths and realities of franchising? We're going to dispel some of those myths. Um, how do you go about identifying the best business option for you? And then how to build your personal business model. So just some things to think about uh, in that business model that you may or may not have thought about previously. So a little bit about FranNet. FranNet's been around since 1987. So we're going on 34 years now, and we are an international franchise consulting firm. We have over 100 offices uh, located across North America. We have national partnerships with SCORE and the Small Business Development Center. If you guys are not familiar with those organizations, I highly recommend that you uh, learn about them if you want to be in business. They're a, an incredible resource. They're a division of the Small Business Administration, and their services are free. SCORE mentors are volunteers. So they are individuals who've had success in business and want to volunteer their time to mentor other business owners and prospective business owners. And the Small Business Development Center, they are not volunteers. They are employed. Their services integrate with the community colleges. So there's a Tarrant SBDC, there's a Collin SBDC, there's Dallas. Um, and so you are able to utilize their expertise as well 
they are paid through our tax dollars, through the university systems. So I highly encourage that if you want to explore business ownership, that you seek out those resources. What we do at FranNet is match people who want to be in business with a franchise that meets their needs. So our goal is to provide the education. We always start with what we're doing today to help people understand franchising and then individuals that want to explore further, we will discuss at the end of this session here today how our process works. And just like SCORE and the Small Business Development Center, our services are free to our clients as well. Um, the best analogy that I would say to what we do is what an executive recruiter is doing. So an executive recruiter is matching employers and employees and they are paid by the employer. The franchisors that partner with us have said, hey, we need some help growing. We cannot get the word out about our brand um, across the whole US. So we wanna partner with FranNet because we know that you live and work in your communities and we will pay that referral fee if you bring us a client who moves forward with our franchise. So there's never any upcharge to the client. Um, we are just here to facilitate and educate and help clients make confident decisions about their future and whether or not franchise ownership is the path that they want to take. So as I mentioned, we're, we're focused on education. We want clients to make informed decisions. Our franchisors are screened. We do not work with just any franchise that says they want to partner with us. They have to meet FranNet standards. So we evaluate their franchise disclosure document, talk to franchisees, just like we would encourage our clients to do. And we'll talk about that a little more as we go through our, our time together today. Um, and then we also are screening our, our clients. So if we're working with a candidate that we think may not be you know, a good fit for business ownership, or maybe they're not financially ready. It's really important. So we're not out there to just try to sell a franchise. It really needs to be a good fit and a win-win for everyone. So I'm sure what's on so many people's minds right now, obviously, is what we've been experiencing um, for about the last nine months or so. So we'll just go through that you know, topic right now and, and uh, hopefully address it to everyone's um, satisfaction here. But please, of course, uh, ask me if you have any questions, just take yourself off mute or, or put a chat in the chat box. Um, you know, Because FranNet has been around since 1987, we went through the dot-com bust, we went through the Great Recession. Uh, now we're in COVID-19, obviously. And so there's been a shift, I think, in the types of businesses and the types of people interested in going into business right now. Um, the focus has been recession resistant, lower costs, lower overhead, and really kind of more service-based businesses. And you might be surprised, but a lot of these types of franchises have really done quite well over the last 12 months and um, you know, have not been hit as hard as many of the types of businesses that you've heard about so much in the news and you know, kind of seen struggling in your neighborhoods. So I want to encourage you, I mean, you're doing, what I highly recommend everybody do is educate yourself. Take this time to learn. You may decide this is not right for me. This is not the right time. I don't have the risk tolerance and hey, that's okay. We get it. We know business ownership and franchise ownership is not for everybody. Um, you may decide, I'm just going to tap the brakes. I'm going to proceed cautiously. I want to make sure that, you know, the vaccine is in place and a lot of people are, are receiving it. Um, and I'm going to have a little more clarity on COVID-19. So think about, you know, as you're exploring these options, what is clarity for you and what is truly realistic? And then there are those who may just decide, I'm going to go full speed ahead. This is the time. I'm going to take advantage of opportunities. Interest rates are low right now. There's increased vacancies. Um, it has been a landlord's market, but now it's turning more to a tenant's market, unfortunately, because some of these businesses have closed. So there could be a, a huge economic opportunity on the other side. So you want to be ready. So you're going to prepare now and take off uh, and be kind of ahead of the game. So just think about the fact that searching for an opportunity is not the same as committing 
to a purpose. All If you decide that you want to go through FranNet's process, all we ask is that you commit the time to doing your due diligence so that you can walk away with more knowledge and some, 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 some confidence in what you decide to do. So before we kind of change topics and move on here, I just want to verify that nobody has any comments or questions at this time. Okay, well, I will continue on then. And I just want to ask you to imagine that you're the owner of a successful business. How do you feel like your life might be better? How do you feel like your life might be different? Like, what does success mean to you? And I'm going to guess that a lot of these ideas came to mind for you as you um, started thinking through that. And there's no right or wrong answer. Success means very different things to different people. As I mentioned in the beginning, I've been doing this for eight years. It, but the commonalities are really people seeking more fulfillment in their work, seeking more flexibility and independence with their time and with their future, more control. You know, that's a big, big thing for me. I need, I need the control. I need the flexibility. I always needed that um, in my work because, as I mentioned, I left to stay home with my children. So I wanted to make sure that I had that control and flexibility in my career to still do what I needed to do. Obviously, everybody's looking for uh, making money. So I don't know, you know, obviously some people were laid off last year. So that's been an issue as well. So yes, um, a comment in the chat, success means more flexibility. So thank you, Valencia. It's not all about the money, you know, for a lot of people. I have clients tell me, you know, hey, I've been there and done that. Success means more to me now than just a paycheck. So whatever you take away from this today, I would just encourage you to think about what you're seeking to accomplish if you do decide to go into business for yourself. What is it for you? So while we talk about some of these things that business ownership can help you accomplish, it does seem that most people do choose to work for somebody else. So why do you think that would be? Here are some of the concerns that I hear most often. Risk. You know, a job is going to be safer than a business. Uh, I want to wait until the economy gets better. Um, it does cost money to get into business, obviously. And do I have enough money to start the business and run the business? And do I have the right knowledge and skills to start and run the business? I had that thought quite a bit when I was leaving um, the website and online marketing company that I worked for for six years. That was the startup that I mentioned. And I thought, you know, this is what I've been doing the last six years. If I were to go out on my own, you know, how would I implement that? Um, knowledge into starting my own business. So these are thoughts that a lot of people have that I believe kind of tend to set them back or hold them back when they really want to think about owning their own business. So when it comes to risk perception and a job, um, is working for somebody safe? Um, I think that we all realized last year specifically uh, that there's really no guarantees um, generally in the short term, you know, that, that job can be safe. The employer has gone through quite a bit of time and energy and money. A lot of times maybe flying you to, a, um, uh, their headquarters and, you know, putting you up in a hotel and feeding you and some of those things to make sure that you're the right fit for their business. Um, but unfortunately the reality is, you know, can you really be sure that your job is safe? Uh, can your performance determine your security? I've had lots of clients over the years tell me that, you know, hey, I got my best uh, review that I've ever gotten. And then a month or two later, I got laid off. Things completely out of their control. You know, maybe the company changed ownership. Um, you know, maybe just changed what, what their services or products were. And it has no fault of the employee. So you really want to think about, will you meet your long-term financial goals of security and retirement? Unfortunately, you know, I hear from a lot of people that the longer tenured, higher paid employees tend to be at higher risk because these employers recognize that they can hire younger, um, maybe fresh out of college, new employees or 
or less experienced employees at a lower rate that might be, and I hear this so much in IT. Uh, my clients that I work with that have been in IT say they, they feel like they're aging out. You know, they're not keeping up, particularly with some of the things that the younger hires, uh, the knowledge that they have. So certainly business ownership, there's risk in business ownership. Right now, today, I will tell you there is risk in everything. And at first, owning your business is going to be scary. And even into your business, it can be scary. You know, we all have ups and downs in entrepreneurship uh, in times that, that we uh, worry. But nobody can take it away. You're not going to be downsized. You're not going to be transferred or fired. You make those choices for your business. You can control how fast you want to grow the business. So as I mentioned, um, you know, I had been with AT&T and I had been with the startup and everything that I did during those careers was based on a quota. And it was always, what have you done for me lately? And so the nice advantage to uh, owning your own business is you can decide how fast you want to grow. So sometimes when clients are doing you know, validation, which means they're talking to other franchisees, they'll learn uh, some are obviously uh, generating more revenue and do better than others, but it may just be because that other person is content with where they are. They don't have that same goal. They don't have that same uh, level that they're trying to achieve. Um, so in most cases, the longer you own that business, the safer it can become. Hopefully you have built up a clientele, you have employees, you have a good reputation, and you can continue to grow your business based on that. So, you know, the rules are changing these days and really the shift is going from job security to income security. There's a very broad interest now in diversification of income streams and portfolios. So that may be the reason that you guys are on this session today. Many people are choosing franchise ownership as a path to diversification. Um, and so, you know, how can you lower your risk? And you can do so by looking for businesses with specific market characteristics. So we're going to talk about what some of those market characteristics are. Um, so there are markets that are driven by demographics and Robbie is joining us today and he is in the senior care industry. And so that is one that is truly growing. Um, people are turning 65 at a rate of seven to 10,000 every day and will continue to do so. The baby boomers, the youngest baby boomers are in their mid fifties now. So for a good 10 to 15 years, you know, that rate is going to continue. Um, residential repairs. Folks are, um, you know, potentially physically unable to do what they used to be able to do in their homes. I think the baby boomers, I know my family uh, was raised in kind of a do-it-yourself um, mentality, but it, it just becomes an interest level is no longer there potentially or a phys not physically being able to do it. And then the younger folks have just not been raised in that. They've kind of been raised with a Google mentality and things getting done quickly. And so hiring that out, as we all know, some of those um, uh, home repairs that we try to do on our own can drag out a lot longer uh, than they might if we just hired somebody to do it. Cleaning is another one. Um, the older generation may not physically be able to do it. The younger generation is busy, both parents working, uh, active kids, and just choose not to do it. There's also essential services. Automotive. Automotive, uh, we drive our cars. We may not be driving them as much, but we still drive our cars here in DFW everywhere we go. So we have to maintain them. Cars are staying on the road longer. I've been hearing on the news what a huge demand there is for used vehicles right now. Um, damage restoration is another one that's essential. If you've ever had to, you know, um, water leak in your home or had to call one of these companies out, they're paid for by insurance. It's not necessarily, you know, the major destruction like a fire or a tornado. Obviously that is included, but there are unforeseen things with pipes breaking um, in homes and things like that where these damage restoration companies come out and clean up and sometimes restore. 
there are sign companies. You guys know wherever you're going now, there's signs everywhere about social distancing and, you know, mask and all those sorts of things. And so sign companies continue to grow. I uh, had a client purchase a sign business uh, and get started last February and he keeps me updated and he's doing very well. Um, commercial cleaning, we talked about residential commercial cleaning is another uh, area that's growing. I mean, I was in the bank not too long ago and there was someone cleaning in there while I was there. So these businesses that have, you know, people coming in, whether it's employees or clients are continuing um, and more so now needing to keep their, their locations clean. And these services that serve the outside, never had to slow down, pool service, tree care, lawn maintenance, clients still need these, these grass is going to grow, trees are going to need to be trimmed, whether there's a pandemic or not. So these services are considered essential and continued to grow um, during 2020. And then there are businesses that help other businesses, which you may or may not have thought of, but there's coaching, uh, digital marketing is big. A lot of these companies have had to change how they're reaching their clients, how they're going to market. So these digital marketing companies are needed more so than ever. Staffing, some companies have laid off, they're rehiring again. And then of course, employee training and sales training is going to continue to be a need. And these, a lot of these companies who have downsized no longer have those people full-time on staff. So they are outsourcing those services. So just some things to think about. Your cars are always going to need maintenance. You're, there's always going to be repairs at your house. Seniors are going to need care. Um, essential businesses that are open are going to need the signage, the advertising, the cleaning. There's always going to be mosquitoes. Children are needing tutoring. These poor families are trying to teach their kids at home. So virtual tutoring was growing uh, last year. And then more people are trying to focus on their health. I mean, I've seen it as a gym owner. We have lost members, but we've also gained members because people recognize the value of a strong immune system and taking care of themselves. So these are things that you really want to kind of think about as you're evaluating opportunities. So let's talk about how to get into business. You can start a business from scratch, you can buy an existing business, or you can buy a franchise. And what are some of the advantages and disadvantages to each of these? So you start a business, you, you start it from scratch, you get to have total control. You get to make all the decisions, you get to be creative, there's no predetermined rules. So that can be a really large upside for uh, that entrepreneurial spirit. You can build a business from your passion and a lot of people really have that desire. They found a need and they wanna build a business from it. But just while those are advantages, there are also disadvantages. You, you must create the system. So while you get to, you also have to figure out how to do that. You may have limited financial options. You go into a bank and tell them that you're starting this business from scratch. You don't have any history and it can be very difficult to get a loan. And so therefore your ramp up may be slower. If you are starting a business that's maybe a new product or a service, you are going to have to potentially do a lot of education for folks to help them understand um, you know, why they might need this, what the product or service is, and the, what the value of it is, and why they might need it. So that can lead to a slower ramp up. So that leads people to say, I want to buy an existing business. I want to buy a business that's already up and running. And there are definitely advantages to that. Cash flow. Uh, if a business is cash flowing, obviously, you know, that's something that people uh, like the idea of is to be generating money from day one. Um, hopefully there's goodwill, there's happy clients. You can base your decision on actual financial results. Those financial results are going to be more attractive to lenders. You're not going to be in a situation where you're trying to educate people about why they need something that markets established, customers are established, employees are established. Hopefully the systems are in place um, and in some cases owners are financing. So these are some key advantages. 
But while the business may be cash flowing, it may not be cash flowing. And I had a lady um, considering a business a few years ago and said, why on earth would anybody buy a business that's not cash flowing? Well, there's some definite advantages. Perhaps you can get in at a lower uh, cost and turn the business around. So it could end up being, if you have the wherewithal to really take it and run with it, it could be you know, a high advantage for you to buy a business that's not cash flowing. Um, there might be bad will. So you may have to really help people understand that they need to give you another try. Um, I was actually participating, viewing a panel of some superstar franchisees with one of the brands that we work with. And they were sharing how they had reached out to everybody who, you know, had, had been a client and, and stopped coming and those who'd given them bad reviews and learned what their concerns were so that they could get that turned around. Um, the business might be overpriced. This is a pretty common thing I hear with existing businesses. You know, somebody built this business potentially from their passion. It's their baby. And so they may have a greater, higher level of goodwill incorporated in that price than what it's actually valued at. So that can be a setback for people. Um, there could be poor training and support. You know, the owner has decided that he or she is ready to retire and move away. And so if this is a new business for you, what training and support will you be receiving? You want to make sure that you do your research to make sure there's no hidden seller motives. Um, I did hear a story years ago about um, someone who was the client of a friend netter, one of my colleagues, and he was selling his business and on paper, it looked really strong. And she asked, you know, why are you selling this business? Well, there was a law changing that was really going to detrimentally impact the future of that business. But without a lot of due diligence, somebody could come in and, you know, look at those financials and go, oh, wow, you know, this is, this is a great deal. And then six months later, the law changes and there's a big, a big change in, in the future of that business. Don't assume all your employees are going to stay and don't assume you want them all to stay. Uh, that panel that I, I participated in or, or listened to, that they let a lot of people go. And we just recently acquired uh, two of our four new gyms we recently acquired from another owner. And that's part of what we're having to do. We're coming in and seeing that these employees are really not the right fit. So we're kind of having to to uh, clean house there a little bit, which can be, you know, a little extra work. So don't just assume every employee is going to stay and every employee is going to be great. You may not want them. And you want to make sure that you get enough of the financials to verify that there's no surprises when it comes to the financial side. I've had people give me feedback that, you know, they got into a business and then realized not everything was disclosed. So our next option is buying a franchise. What are some of the advantages to franchise ownership? You know, the first one on this list is what most people think about, which is that name recognition. But I want to caution you about that. A lot of the brands, if you already recognize the name, there may not be any territory available. There might be, but sometimes if they're that far along and you recognize that brand, it may not be the right opportunity from the perspective of what you're looking for for scalability. When we bought our gyms, they had been in business, I believe 16 or 17 years at the time that we signed, but nobody had heard of them. We were the first one in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. So um, it's not necessarily um, you know, going to be a situation where any franchise would have name recognition. But if they're a franchise, they, they should have a proven business system. They need to be offering training and support. That's the reason you purchase a franchise. Statistically, they have lower failure rates. They can have lower costs because some of the, you know, initial mistakes have already been made. And so the toes have been stubbed, the knees have been skibbed and skinned. So you might overcome some of those initial tests that might not end up resulting in positive outcomes for you. Um, because they're a franchise, there should be more financing options. Uh, and there's a disclosure. Every franchise files with the Federal Trade Commission a document called the Franchise Disclosure Document. And they are required to release all kinds of information in that FDD. The smallest one I've ever seen is about 100 pages. 
if they're a larger franchise, they may be up to 400 pages. The history of the company, the leadership, um, there's an item 19 in most franchises with financials. You have a list of the franchisees. So that leads in to the next advantage, which is a franchise family, which I see as a key advantage with my role here at FranNet. We collaborate and work together and help each other a lot. And I saw such value in that when we were going through a time that nobody had be ever been through last year. So we bounced ideas off of each other. We started having weekly calls. Our, our headquarters, you know, uh, started having us kind of, we call it a hangout where everybody just kind of chats and, and discusses what's going well and we're learning new things. So I highly, um, you know, recommend that franchise family piece of a franchise. If you're looking for a franchise that you make sure that, that it's people that you want to collaborate with, you have things in common with and want to work with. Um, some of the disadvantages, there may be fewer industry options. You know, those Shark Tank ideas may not be a franchise yet. They're not proven yet. Franchises are going to have different levels of structure, and some people may find that the structure is more than what they're comfortable with. There are territory restrictions. When you buy a franchise, you're buying a specific territory, and you're working within that territory versus an independent business you, um, you know, you don't have those restrictions. So you're only going to be able to sell their products. Um, you can't, they have a brand to protect. So you can't bring your own products into their location and you will have ongoing royalties. And some people view that as a disadvantage as well. And we'll talk about royalties here a little more in a minute. So to define a franchise, it's short and sweet. It's a license to use that name and trademarks, products and systems in exchange for that franchise fee and those ongoing royalties. So I mentioned this franchise disclosure document um, a couple of minutes ago. So I'm gonna give you a little more in insight and information on this. It's very, very unique to franchising. Um, it is going to list the franchisor's time in business, what the business experiences of their, of their leadership, have they ever had a bankruptcy? That is huge, that is huge. You will have that conversation very early on. And if that is a deal breaker, then it's out there. There's no, they can't hide that and everybody can move on. Same thing with litigation, that's all listed. So you'll know litigation between franchisees, litigation between franchisor and franchisees, and you can evaluate if this is a brand that you have confidence in based on what you're learning um, in this document. The costs are going to be listed. So if any of you are going online and looking at franchises, um, you know, a lot of times the only thing you see on the cost is what the franchise fee is. Well, there's a lot more to getting started in business than just what the franchise fee is. So you'll want to know what other fees and what working capital you will need to get your business up and running and how much working capital they expect that you will need. Nobody can tell you, okay, you are going to break even in X amount of months or you are going to be profitable in X amount of months, but you can learn that from talking to other franchisees. So you can have a general idea of how much working capital you feel like you need in order to you know, hold yourself over basically and invest in what you need to invest in to get your business ramped up. The royalties to be listed. Some are listed as percentages, whereas others are flat fees. Some are on a scale. So that's all explained. The franchise contract is in there. So you'll know what their obligations are to you and what your obligations are to them. Territories are defined. So in some territories, it's um, a certain amount of people in a certain age group. In other territories, it might be a mileage radius. So you'll have the listing and contact information for other franchisees as well um, for past franchisees and current franchisees. So this is what I was talking about before that is a key element of franchising that separates it from other brands. Some will provide earnings claims, not all. Uh, financial statements and all their policies and procedures are included. So I know that was a lot of information. Before we move off of the franchise disclosure document, just want to open it up real quick and see if anybody wants to ask a question. 
Okay, great. Well, let's move on then. Um, we already kind of touched on this about current and past franchisees. And again, this is something very unique in a franchise that you don't have access to uh, with independent business ownership. So another trend that we are really seeing right now, I mentioned in the beginning of this uh, session here about individuals looking to diversify. So there's a path to franchise ownership that's called semi-absentee. And that can be a popular method for those who want to keep a job, um, want to, um, you know, phase out of a job potentially. When we bought our gyms, that was our plan. My husband referred to the franchise as his exit strategy. Not ready to walk away from a paycheck immediately. That can be a difficult decision, especially when you have a family that is dependent on your income. Um, but people will potentially want to um, use the franchise as a means to create another stream of income to make it more comfortable to exit their job. Um, you in that situation would generally have a full-time manager that's going to run the day-to-day -day operations um, and then never assume that you are, you know, going to be, um, you know, hands-off completely, 100% absentee. There is no such thing. Um, you need to be overseeing the business, but not in it 100% full-time all day, every day. They tend to potentially have a little higher investment because in most cases you need brick and mortar. You're, high, you're paying that manager and you're doing some advertising to get people to you. Some of the more common segments are building and construction, health and wellness, fitness, uh, beauty, hair care. You know, you go get your hair cut in a super cuts. Chances of you seeing the owner there are pretty slim. So you may wanna keep your job, your work would be potentially after hours. Um, you should be able to monitor that remotely. Um, and you may wanna be using this as an opportunity to hedge against some economic changes. So let's touch on some franchising myths and dispel some of these. Number one, franchising is only fast food and retail. Well, I think we've really you know, dispelled this already because we talked about some of the industries that are growing uh, right now. There's over 3,600 franchise companies in more than 90 industries with over 900,000 operating units. So as you can see here, the fast food and retail is still just a very small percentage of the total opportunities that are available. Myth number two, franchises succeed because of the quality of the product. Okay, and I don't want to rag on any particular company, but I'm just going to say that I would venture to guess that when people eat at McDonald's, it may not be because they're seeking out the very best hamburger that they've ever had. Chances are you could probably find better hamburgers somewhere else. So if it isn't a product, then what would it be? And it is those systems. It is convenience. A lot of people will say, you know, I'm out, I'm hungry. I know when I'm gonna get there. The operations, the accounting. For me as a mom, it was how can I get out of this house and let my child go play on the playground for a little while. So there's various reasons that people might purchase from different businesses that may not necessarily have anything to do with the product. Myth number three, successful franchises emerge in new industries with no new competitors. Well, were there hamburgers when Ray Kroc invented McDonald's? Yes, there were. So he took a product that was already being sold and enjoyed and presented it in a different way. So they, successful franchises tend to emerge from well-established industries and they create that consolidation. Competition is a good thing it shows that there's a market for a product or a services. And so franchises are, are generally not gonna enter segments where there's no competition. Sometimes they will take a service and, or a product and present it in a different way, like we said. So 
Ray Kroc started McDonald's where you could actually stay in your car and get that hamburger, or you could walk, you would be walking up to the counter rather than sitting in a restaurant and expecting a waitress to come and take your order. So myth number four, franchises are expensive. And this is really one of my favorite topics because expensive means different things to different people. So hopefully, you know, you will get a better understanding of what the investment range is from this slide. Only 28% of franchises are over 500,000. And of the franchises that are in FranNet's inventory, it's a very small percentage. I would say we have less than five and we have 150 to 200 franchises that we work with. So as you can see, the bulk of the investment ranges are between 100 and 500. And when I use that term investment range, that is all in, that is not franchise fee. So those are the things we talked about before, insurance, advertising, you know, working capital, all of those uh, investment dollars that are needed to get your business started, up and running, open, et cetera. And one thing I'm really gonna hound on today is that there is no automatic correlation between the cost of the franchise and the potential return. So do not assume that a higher investment will create a higher return. So how much money do I need? All in, if you're looking at getting a loan, a lot of lenders are going to ask you for 25 to 30%. I would say that's a standard rule of thumb, but it is not with the same with everyone. There's a wide, um, mix of what lenders are looking for. They're gonna look at your full liquidity. They're gonna look at your net worth. Um, you know, how much is, uh, you know, um, what's your credit score, just all of those variations. But this is a good rule of thumb. So just, if you're gonna be investing in a $100,000 business and you've got 25 to 30%, you should be um, in a spot where a lender would want to consider you uh, to fund your business. So how do you want to fund your business? You can, of course, use your personal savings, which some people choose to do. They don't like to have debt and that's completely understandable. With interest rates a little bit lower, some people are choosing to hang on to their savings and look for other options. Um, home equity, uh, mortgage rates are really low right now. So if you've got home equity, that could be a good path. Um, we talked about existing businesses and sellers maybe wanting to finance. So that's another option. There is the option of using some retirement funds. So there was a program created by the IRS. It's called a rollover business startup. And it was designed specifically for individuals who want to use retirement funds to fund a business. That it's completely legal by the IRS, as I said, they started the program, they developed the program. There are no taxes and no penalties. There are fees to do it. So, you know, not just anybody will do it. I will tell you a lot of CPAs and financial advisors don't understand it. I have a great CPA that has helped a lot of my clients really understand it. He's the most knowledgeable of anyone um, that I know from the CPA perspective on it. Um, we also have funding partners that really specialize in this aspect of funding a business. And so if that's a path that you want to consider, we can um, connect you with those resources to learn more about it. And I intentionally skipped over number two, friends, relatives, or partners, because I really, um, it's not my recommendation. I know people go that path, and I know there have been successful business ventures with partners, relatives, friends, but just be very, very cautious if that is a path that you choose to take because I have heard of many family relationships being damaged, friendships being ended over business deals gone bad. So if you are going to uh, invest in a business with someone like that, make sure that you get a partnership agreement written up by an attorney because they can you know, plan for all the what ifs that you may not think about that could potentially happen. All right, myth number five, a high return requires a high investment. So I touched on this a minute ago. Service businesses can tend to require a far less investment 
and yield a higher return. So if you think about a business, maybe that's not brick and mortar and you're going to someone to provide a service, it might be a more scalable opportunity because you're not dependent on somebody driving to you. You can decide how far you wanna go. You may have less overhead. So don't assume that investing more is going to generate more income. Myth number six, industry experience is required. Do hair salons want their owners to have haircutting experience? Absolutely not. They want people who will use their system, who will focus on being an owner. They have business skills, they have management, they have leadership, communication, operations. That's the type of business owner they are seeking. They will teach you their business. They will teach you um, their industry and their systems. It's harder to teach the business side. So why do you wanna own a franchise? It can be a great fit if it's a vehicle that can get you to your destination while meeting your lifestyle and financial goals while being an opportunity to reduce that risk and create that income security versus job security. So we touched on royalties a little bit ago. Franchisors lose money in the short term. This, the royalty payments, if they're a percentage, tend to be lower. I just had a franchisor tell me earlier today that um, if somebody's going into a new market, they will lower the royalties also in the beginning because they're trying to develop, develop that brand. So uh, they're going to be, the support costs in the beginning are going to be higher. Um, they're training you. They're helping you grow your business. So it should be a win-win for everybody. They help you be successful. Then you pay those royalties when you're bringing that money in. Again, if it is a percentage on gross revenue, their support costs are going to be lower. So they are going to make those mo the money on the royalties. I really want to caution you about if you're comparing franchises, oh, this royalty is 6% and this royalty is 8%. I like 6% better. No, you really want to think about what are you getting in return for what you're paying on that royalty. So you could be paying 6% and getting no support from the franchisor, talking to franchisees that say, you know, they aren't doing anything for me, or paying 8% and really finding value in what they're providing. So don't just focus on the number. And you need to think of it really just as a trade-off. You're exchanging some of those profits in the long term for some of that risk reduction in the short term. So franchising is a proven systematic approach to starting and staying in business. I heard an acrostic a few years ago for the word system that has really stuck with me and it's saving yourself significant time, energy, and money. So as you are evaluating these franchisors and thinking about their systems, Try to determine if you see these as saving yourself significant time, energy, and money by implementing what they have for you. What about their training? What about, you know, the marketing and their teamwork? How does this franchise collaborate and work together and how will they support you? Franchises are not all the same. You'll see some will have a very strong you know, aggressive growth strategy where others are very content with only adding, you know, five or two, five or 10, maybe new locations a year. Doesn't mean one is right or wrong. Um, some just have more units than others and it, and it may be designed that way. Um, some are gonna be more structured than others. We talked about that a, a little bit ago. And obviously there's a very different investment range and there's no correlation between the cost of the franchise and the potential return. So we have a question here in the chat. Let me read it real quick. Okay, um, we have got somebody leading. Thanks for joining us, Lance, and I will send you the follow-up information. Um, so be aware of statistics. Think about your success. Don't worry about statistics and how other people are doing in this franchise. Make sure that the franchise that you're interested in is a great fit for you and is going to help you meet your goals. In a franchise, you're able to be in business for yourself, but not by yourself. And this is really a key 
aspect of franchising. We've talked about that franchise family with among franchisees and the franchisor. So how do you find your perfect fit? You separate the function of the business from the function of the owner. So this is another key aspect that I want you to take away today. A lot of people get into business for the wrong reason. They get into business because they get enamored with a product or a service and they are not thinking about the function of the owner. So when you're looking at opportunities, are you willing to follow the franchisor's system? Does it fit in your budget? Do not undercapitalize yourself. That is one of the key reasons that franchises fail is that you're undercapitalized. Is that risk level acceptable? Am I comfortable with this level of risk? Everybody's going to have a different risk tolerance. Well, I enjoy my business. Life is too short to wake up and be miserable going and doing what you're doing every day. So is it something that you will enjoy? Really think about What's important to you? What This goes back to the success slides at the beginning. Those building blocks. Are you seeking challenge, recognition, prestige, equity for retirement, more time for your family and outside interest, more control over your schedule, more independence and freedom? And obviously, everyone is going to say that they are seeking that financial security. So if you decide that you want to learn more and see if there's an opportunity that's a good fit for you, your next step with BrandNet would be completing your personal franchise assessment. It is a proprietary profiling tool, and it will help us learn more about you, what your values and motives are, what your core competencies are. If you've ever done a Myers-Briggs or a DISC, it's very similar to that, but it was created specifically for FranNet. We send you a copy. You review it, you are able to give us feedback. Does this sound anything like me? Um, you know, or does it, is it totally off base? We really want to hear how you feel about your results. And we talk through that and get a better understanding of your results. Um, we want to learn what you're looking for so we can create a business model. How many employees are you comfortable with? What kind of budget? Do you want to be work from home? Do you want to be in an industrial park? Do you want to be in an office building? How much time do you want to commit to your business? How many units are you seeking? Some people come in knowing they want multiple territories where others are content with just one location. What type of customers do you want? Do you want, we talked about damage restoration. Those tend to be high profit, but more one and done versus some opportunities that are recurring revenue or membership based. What are you looking for? Do you want to serve the consumers? Do you want to serve other businesses? Do you want to provide a service or a product? Are you wanting to a newer franchise or more established? What kind of growth? You know, a lot of clients will tell me scalability is one of their top priorities. So what is that for you? Think about what your transferable skills are and this um, assessment will help us evaluate that. What are you good at? What are your skills that we can transfer into business ownership? Sales and marketing are very different. Um, so that is something to really think through. A lot of people, when I say sales, they kind of clench and um, get nervous. Oh no, I don't want to do sales. Well, that means different things to different people. So think about um, if you're the type of person that might want to meet somebody um, to offer a, a bid or a proposal after they've responded to some marketing um, or, you know, are, do you want to cold call? Most people tell me they don't want to cold call. I will tell you there are a few businesses that require heavy cold calling. Um, if you're going to wake up and dread going to do that every day, and that's the primary role of the owner, then that's not going to be a good fit for you. So we want to keep those things in mind. As you think about your business model and what's important to you and how to get into business, I just really want to stress that you also think about your exit strategy. How long do you want to be in this business are you looking for a business that you may end up passing down to your children? Are you looking to sell the business down the road? What is your long-term strategy for your business? It's really important for you as you're going through your research process to bring on 
experts. Hire a franchise attorney before you sign anything. I can't stress that enough. And make sure that it's a franchise attorney, somebody that specializes in the franchise industry. Hire a good CPA, a financial advisor, people that understand your situation and can guide you through what makes the most sense for you and your family. These books are suggested reading. Um, the more than just French fries and street smart franchising are focused specifically on franchising, while the E-Myth Revisited is a book generally just about business ownership. So I recommend those books as well. So at the conclusion uh, this afternoon, we're going to send you the recording and a link to our assessment if you have an interest in completing that. I would greatly appreciate if you guys would take your phone and scan our QR code here and complete our evaluation. We always are looking to improve and be able to provide uh, insight that our um, potential business owner candidates are seeking. So please um, scan that while that's up on the screen and take a moment when we're done to complete our evaluation. Thank you all for joining us. Oh my gosh, it is 12.59. I held it to an hour. Um, here is our contact information, both mine and Roxanne's. What can I answer for you as we conclude today or how else can I be of assistance to you before we, before we end our session? Yes, I will put up the scan bar again. There you go. Any other requests or needs before we... Um, in today. All right, well, I will take that as a no. I wanna wish you guys all a great rest of your day and a great rest of your week. Please reach out to myself or Roxanne if we can answer any additional questions. It's been a pleasure um, presenting this information to you today and I wish you all the best. Have a great day, bye.